I don't mean this insultingly, but your ideas are so bananas. You are a monster. That first paddle, that 800 kilometers, my body was in so much pain. My emotions were fucking crippled. I thought I was going to go back to my normal life, but it completely changed my life. I wanted to snowboard over in France in the French Alps. So I made out I was a chef and I become like a head chef over in Italy because of it. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Tell me more. How did that happen? My life's like pretty out of control. That's it. Pack my shit on me out of here. For me, I'm just like, nah, it's just cool. Why don't you try it? And that's it. This is the life that I've always wanted to live. I have a list of your achievements here and they are bananas. You're a world record holder. And it seems to me like you put a bunch of words in a hat and you're like, okay, I'm going to be, oh, 21 days on... Uh, Oh, the deserts in Europe on the back of a mule. Like, it seems like that's how you came up with some of these things. It's, I, I know it seems like that, but uh, believe it or not, like everything's purpose, you know, like from then till now in the last eight years really has had purpose from one to another and how am I going to reach a new audience and, you know, having some dark times and that. So I went back to the ocean I was, thought I'd healed myself. So I wanted to share that message with people and spread the word, you know, that you can recover from what I went through as a kid and in learning new disciplines means I've got to learn how my body moves, my mind moves, my emotions are with everything. So it's like I've got to learn all over again and then also work out what's the crossover as well with each of these sports on a mental side of things and an emotional side of things and what tools I can use to be able to get through those tough times whether it's, you know, running 42 kilometers or skating for 56 days through 57 degree heat in Mojave Desert, you know, each of them obviously got challenges with them. And I went into the endurance events to start off with just because each of the days of the events, I go through emotional roller coaster and physical pain that most people would in a week or a month. So I get that again and again. So every couple of minutes, something's going on. You know, I've got to deal with something. So for me, I get to practice it. You know, I get to practice these emotions 40 times a day where most people only have that practice once a week, maybe. So you have these moments. And, and I know in my head, let's say that I'm on the treadmill and I'm doing a run and you hit that part of like CO2 max where you're like, your arms are pulsating and you can't breathe. Every inch of your body is on fire. And in your mind, you're like, yeah, now's the time to give up. <laughs> and I have a choice. I have a choice that I get to make, which is like, can I keep going? Do I give in to giving up? And I'm going to be honest with you, more often than not, I give in to giving up. You know, I could work a little bit harder. I could work a little bit later. I could make that extra phone call. I could push. I could lift a little bit heavier weights. I could run a little bit harder. And in my everyday life, more often, I just take the easier path. I'm just being honest with you. Sure. What is it that you're learning in those moments when you're standing on top of a hot air balloon, 7,500 feet above the ground, and you're about to jump off of it, you're not thinking, wow, this is going to be a great marketing feat. <laughs> like, this is going to be a, a great, I hope you're not. I mean, maybe you are. But, you know, when you're skateboarding through the desert and it's day 14 of 56, and as you mentioned, it's 56 degrees Celsius, it's 120 degrees Fahrenheit, and, you know, maybe your feet are blistering or you're running out of sweat and you're like, why the hell am I doing this? Like, most of us are going to say, like, I don't really have to do this. What are you telling yourself to keep you going or why? What what happens in your head in that moment? So for me, they're all been purpose. There was a lot of answers that I wanted questions to most of my life and gone through therapists. They just won't give me those answers that I want. So for me, it was just about being authentic, you know, really finding the answers and really understanding it. And in doing that, you know, it was about pushing myself to different sorts of purposely pushing myself in different sorts of physical, mental, emotional stress and trauma and work out how I get out of it and then cross-reference it with so many people around the world where I'm doing these events as well. You know, like I rode a motorcycle across the US and, you know, washed 200 homeless people's feet in Philly and just sat there and just listened to them like for three days, just listening to these people, how they were in that position, but how are they still smiling and still happy and still keeping on going? And then spoke with LGBTQ in, in Brooklyn and went up to Buffalo to Bikers Against Child Abuse. I went out to Sandy Hook Elementary School and spoke to the whole community out there. So I really went around the whole country. And the reason why I did that as well is because in Australia, there's we've got 20 million people. In the US, there's 320 million people. So there's more conversations that I can have, you know, on such an exponential level to really understand and learn about it, you know, not just myself and my own childhood trauma, but 
understand what trauma actually is for everyone. How does it affect everyone? What is it that everyone's looking for, you know? And and for me, that's kind of what I was searching for, those answers. So for the first eight years, you know, I keep pushing myself and going to different parts of the globe just to be able to share that message of, you know, keep on moving forward, that message of hope that anything is possible as well. And now I wrote a few books, put some films out on that geo, and, you know, now it's just about doing cool shit. And still keep spreading that. You know, I'm in the Maldives at the moment. I'm about to paddle 320 miles over eight days here. And so for me, that's kind of what it's all about. You know, it's all about understanding and just having that authentic self about it. And I go about things a little bit different way than most people do. And so going back to, you know, you stepping off the treadmill, even though it's a long way skating, you know, 5,000 kilometers across the US, for me, it's kind of easy. All I'm doing is skating from point A to point B, you know, going to happen along the way i don't overthink it at all all i know is i'm just going to finish that skate simplifies my life you know i'm going from point a to point b and really that's all we're trying to do each day you know we want to wake up in the morning we want to make sure we go to bed at night you know we don't really know what happens in the day just take each day as it is don't think too far ahead on it and just deal with things that they come but once they've gone then I just, they have to go for me. Like I can't keep piling up. I can't think about the shark that just knocked me off my board or anything because I know in three minutes time, there's going to be another one. So I can't <laughs> pile up all these emotions and fears. I just have to let it go and just keep on moving forward and look at something ahead. So if we go to the paddle, you know, all I was doing is working from headland to headland, you know, work my way along. And then, as I said, you know, there was big waves, there's cold currents and nights. I had to sleep on the beach because sharks were attacking me. And, you know, 21 shark encounters are great whites and it's smashing my board, smashing my fin and everything. So I had to stop and fix a fin along the way. And, and you, weren't, you, know, you weren't afraid in those moments? There was a couple of moments, like when I first saw them, but there was not much I could do about it because they were on deserted beaches. Though. There was no access to there. I had no cell service there at all. So it was kind of just me and... And the shark. So, you know, what could I do? The only thing I could do is just keep on going. But it took me a minute to work it out, you know, seeing a few of them. And then um, once I'd seen them and then, then I just thought I was all right. Like the first five days of that paddle, so it was 17 days. First five days were fucking terror for me. You know, like my body was in so much pain. My emotions were fucking crippled. Things are just running through my head out of control, like like a record player just spinning around, spinning around. But as it spun around so much, I could get sick of listening and watching what I was seeing in my head. So we just started dissecting it out and pulling it out to have this deeper and deeper understanding of what I was actually looking at as well. So while at the same time, you know, there's sharks and waves and all sorts of things that are going on visually in front of me. So without knowing it, I was kind of, I was doing a therapy called EMDR therapy, which is eye movement desensitization reprocessing, which you probably know. You know, and really that was just allowing the emotions to come forward without blocking and stopping them with any vices at all because I couldn't, no one else was around. There's no music, there's no alcohol, there's no people, there's no nothing like that to turn myself to. But at the same time, while these emotions were coming out from deep down inside, like we're talking right down deep, were coming out and spilling out in, in my head and pretty much coming out the top of my head, it felt like. I was getting new information and new raw and natural and beautiful information just from the movement of the ocean, you know, constantly moving and constantly changing and the clouds moving and me moving along. Like, so there was just that poetic moment of like having that horror and distress, but also just being in such a beautiful and most peaceful place I've ever been in as well and not feeling like I'm going anywhere, but being able to look at the shore and know that I am still moving forward. There's a lot of that's going on, but I am still moving forward, you know? So afterwards, when I was really thinking about it, I was like, well, that's it's kind of like what life is, you know? We feel that we're stuck sometimes and we're not moving anywhere, but the fact is we are still moving. We're still moving along and the sun's still rising and setting, you know, so the days are still moving. So we're still moving along no matter what's happening, what's happening in our head. And it's just about being able to open our mind and open our eyes up a little bit wider, you know, look further than the horizon, wider than our peripheral vision and just 360 the whole way around and see there's a big fucking world out there, you know, more so than what's just trapped inside our head. Yeah. So for me, I started to understand that when you go through trauma, it's like you live in a tunnel vision. You know, you've got this tunnel behind you 
And then you've got the tunnel in front of you as well. And that's all you can see. So that's the main focus on everything. So that's why colors and shades, everything that you do, because that's the only light and you're stuck in the middle. And that's all you can see forward and backward. So because that's the strongest backwards that you keep looking back to it, then that's all you're going to attract forwards as well. So it's not until you start breaking down those barriers that we put up around ourselves and really start building a trust within ourselves to open them up even further to really start having a fucking good look around, you know. And then once we realize that, well, you know, we're a part of a massive fucking system here that keeps on going, then we all our problems seem pretty small. You know what I mean? Once we understand, but we need to be results driven. Like for me, I'm always been results driven, you know, to get fitter, faster, stronger, you know, same with my clients, fitter, faster, stronger. We work towards something, but it just seems to be the whole like mental health trauma aspect of it all, how it's marketed anyway. There's no results to it. You know, they, they kind of throw out different words here and they're generic words that don't really mean anything. And uh, I think that's a big problem with it. So no one really knows what they're actually working towards. They know, oh, I want to be happy, but what's that look like? I want to yeah. be in love. What's that look like? I want to be in, you know, rich. I want to be beautiful. I want to be, but what's that can look like? You know, that's not a definitive goal. So if you don't have a definitive goal, how do you know you're having measurable results to work towards it? So if you work on a fitness aspect of it, that you're going through, you know, your trauma, stress, everything else that you're going through in life. But if you look at it in a fitness aspect of it, you know, if you're dropping down a pin, you're getting stronger. So there's a measurable result. And you tell yourself, I want to lose 10 kilos or I want to be able to bench press 100 pounds. You know, you know that you've got to do the work and you can see that you're moving up there. You know, you're at 60 pounds and you're at 70 pounds and you're at 80 pounds. You know that you're working towards what you're doing. And you've got that clear goal. But for most people, when they're trying to get, get rid of their stress, strong, whatever it is, you know, there's just all these silly generic words that mean absolutely nothing. And that's <laughs> the problem I see. As you were speaking, I, I was struck with this thought that all of my most major breakthroughs, meaning I actually came to terms with reality, right? Oh, you know, we're running out of money or, oh, this thing I was hoping would work wouldn't work or this conversations I don't want to have, I have to have. Like, I came to terms with reality. I cut my losses or burned everything to the ground to say like, you know, you can, you can try and take the easy route out. I don't want to have to let go of a staff member. So I'm going to just avoid it. I'm just going to avoid it. I'm just going to avoid it. And then things get so bad, you can't avoid it any longer. And you have to face the reality. You have to face the truth. You have to do the hard things. And then as soon as I accepted of letting go of things, you're suddenly so free. Uh -huh. And so as you were speaking about being on the paddle, being on the board for five days in this constant loop, it's almost as if rather than go into the paddle saying, I'm going to use this to solve all my problems. You put yourself in an environment where you had to burn it all to the ground. You had to face it. You had to come to terms with reality. You had to accept it. And in accepting it, it sounds like on the other side of that, when you can finally let go, when you finally feel free, when you're finally like, none of that stuff is going to work, what actually is going to work for me? And what should I try? And you remove all that ego and everything you now have the freedom to do what you need to do. Is that kind of what happened? Yeah, man, pretty much. So after that first five days, like, well, the end of the fourth day, like I was just in so much pain. I was like, you know, like, have a bit But in any other situation, you would have just, as you said, used the distractions, right? You could have, you yeah. could have grabbed your phone, your podcast, you could have watched TV, you could have checked out with drugs or alcohol, you could have visited with friends, right? Like, you exactly. could totally use all the, all the distractions to distract, but you put yourself in a situation where you had to face it. <laughs> I had to face it, I had no, no choice but to face it. Once I got up in that, so every, I was in so much pain, I paddled into this one surf club and I, was, well, I think that's it for me. Like, I don't know if I can keep going. This is pretty hectic. But I had like just this huge amount of like rush of everything was going on just before I paddled in. Anyway, I went and ate like a couple of roast chickens and had a sleep and got up in the morning. When I woke up in the morning, I felt like I hadn't even paddled anywhere. I was searching for these demons of my past i couldn't even look for them like everything was completely gone like a strange fucking feeling you know like everything had gone my body was so relaxed and i was ready just to go and start paddling again and put my body in the water and i started paddling i was paddling for about five minutes and a 15 foot white pointer came past me just a couple of yards away and i just looked at him and said g'day mate and just kept on paddling. Didn't even worry about him at all. I just knew from that day that everything was going to be cool, you know? 
didn't matter what was getting thrown at me, I was going to be all right. But going into that paddle in the first place, I knew I was paddling across shark breeding grounds the whole way along. And it's the worst summer that Australia's ever seen for shark attacks as well, like right where I was paddling through. So everyone was like, yeah, you're going to die along there. There's probably that 20% chance you're going to fucking live. I just looked at it and I thought, yeah, look, this is going to be tough, but it can't possibly be as tough as what I went through as a kid. I'm just out in the ocean paddling. So I'm going to put the board in the and water. And what, what did you go through for, for our audience? What did you go through as a kid? What did you face? A lot of physical, sexual, emotional abuse as a kid for years. Like I lived on the streets and lived in rock caves on the beach at the age of six, pretty much. Even before then, I had my grandmother, like when I was between the age of two and four, I used to just get drunk and throw me into a fire and smash me around and everything as well. And so, yeah, it was kind of like a pretty violent upbringing no one to really talk to no role models no father figures or anything like that at all so it was um super confusing sort of time you know like wake up at night and my mum's screaming and hear the thuds and door gets smashed open and i've got to quickly run out clothes get ripped off you so i'm naked and freezing cold running down the beach and hiding in rock caves and everything, just shivering, not knowing what was going on or where I was going to go to or anything as well. And so, yeah, it was, it was pretty fucking hectic times going on. So I had to, I guess I had to start uh, survival mode pretty quick. But in looking back at it as well, you know, like I was freezing cold in these rocks, naked, but I'd just go back, to go to my breath and I will just learn to focus on my breath to get my stuff warm and calm. At that same time, I didn't know there was like a thing called breath work or anything back then. You know, this is 40 years ago, let's say. But when I was paddling on the first few days, like there was so much emotional turmoil coming up from my past that I could feel where I'd been struck, where I'd been thrown against walls and everything in my body, you know, and that's what was bringing the emotional pain as well with the physical pain that was coming forward and vice versa. You know, the more I thought about what happened to me as a kid, then I could feel it more in my body where I was hanging on to it as well. So... Yeah, it was pretty fucking hectic times and uh, that, that stuck with me. And uh, as I said, no one I could really turn to or talk to and still try to keep a smile on my face and I was still actively doing things, you know, started, a, you know, I had to, we had no money, you know, we'd, we'd collect bottles and cans and stuff like that from, from the streets and try and get some money out of them. And then I would sell golf balls and frogs and make some pretty good money out of that actually. And so I just sort of, just started just doing things that way, you know, anything I could to start just raising a little bit of money and trying to get a little bit better life for myself as well and skateboarded from a young age from sun up to sun down. And, you know, really I was just building myself to do what I do now. You know, I was always an endurance athlete from a young age, just out of default from what was going on in the house, you know, skateboarding for 13 to 15 hours a day and, and staying out on the streets and staying awake for, you know, a couple of days on end and, so, yeah, so people say, how long have you been an endurance athlete for? But I've really been it all my life. <laughs> and it's funny, skateboarding, you know, I think I'm a little bit older than you. I was kind of a preppy kid in the 90s and all my friends were skateboarders. And I just knew that I couldn't skate. And I never thought to learn. It just wasn't my identity. It's like I hung out with skateboarders. Skaters, I guess we call them. <laughs> I hung out with skaters, you know, the wallet chain and listening to the music and all that stuff. But I would just always watch them. But I marvel at skaters and people who bike and things like that. Because the thought of doing the same trick or trying to hit the same thing over and over and over again, and and knowing that like nine times out of 10 or more, you're going to like hurt yourself a lot, right? Like you're going to break an ankle or you're going to roll something or you're going to skin something or you're going to hit your head on the concrete. Time after time after time, I watch these videos now and I used to think like, boy, that's stupid. Like, why would you put yourself through that? But now I'm just like, holy smokes. It's funny. I speak to all of these really successful entrepreneurs and endurance athletes who come from a skating background because there must have been something that you guys learned by just facing the fear and trying it over and over again. I mean, I'm an outsider marveling at it, but what did you learn skating? (laughs) Yeah, a big part of it that helps in life is we see things in a different way. You know, people see like a, just a normal storm drain that's dried out and water's not going down. But a skater goes, that's a spot I'm going to skate all day, you know, or just even like a little curb. 
people go, oh, shit, you know, just that's where you park your car, where a skater goes, oh, yeah, I can tail slide across there all day. This is going to be epic fun, you know. So we see just things a little bit different, a little, little bit more open to, to what's going on around, I believe, you know, a little bit more creative. And skaters, they're, they're, they're cool people, you know, like they're pretty much – one of the only sports that most of them are non-judgmental to anyone, whether you can skate or can't skate, it doesn't matter what it is. There's, there's like a less of an ego, I, I find, with with skaters compared to, say, surfers. Is that just because skaters know that that hurting yourself, falling down and trying again is just like part of it? You know? Yeah, the outcasts. You know, like it's a little uh. bit different now, but, you know, they're, they're the outcasts. You know, they're like the artists. They're the ones that are shoved aside that were told that they're never going to amount to anything. But yeah, here they are on multi-million dollar contracts, you know, for doing what they love as well at the same time. But, you know, like back in the day, they just, you know, looked at it differently but knew they weren't. It's just something they were just following their passion, something that they loved and what they wanted to do. And, and also like a lot of skaters, like a lot of them, you know, they come from broken homes the same as me. You know, like a lot of kids I spoke spoke with when I was skating across America and, you know, little towns of in New Mexico and that, they would skate with me. They would come from broken homes as well. And it's just the same thing, just a little refuge for them. They come together, they will band together and look after each other as well. And so I think they've got more of a compassionate soul and, and a bit more respect for everyone else because they look at it in, in a, such a downward way. Huh. And so if eight years ago you kicked off and, and did your paddle, there's a bit of life between being the, you know, the kid and the teenager and then running off and doing all of this new endurance stuff. What did you do during your 20s? What did you do during that time? Oh, I was wasted most of the time. I was wasted. I was traveling. I was, you know, heaps of different jobs. And I've always just worked for myself as an entrepreneur. And I mean, I traveled a lot as well and just kept on exploring. and Exploring because you were looking for something or were you running away from stuff? Well, I mean, that's interesting. When I was traveling around, yeah, I guess I was sort of looking for who I was, where I belong. I didn't really have that um, home structure as a kid. But then the, at the same time, the more I think about it is going back to like skating as well, you know, like uh, I traveled around, I skated different spots, you know, I'd skate all over the city, I'd skate all over Australia, I'd go everywhere, like to find new spots places to skate and then go on into surfing and travel the world, go to different surf spots all over the world. So really it was just more about exploring what else is out there. And it's not just about finding an identity for myself, but it's just about understanding what I like. Who am I? Let's go and do different because we can, you know, and that's kind of about it. Like why just have one job, live in the same street for the rest of your life? You know, why not just go out there and explore, see what's going on? Like and it's not about the grass is greener on the other side, but unless you've seen all the sides, like how do you know what's green and what's not really, you know? So if you're living this vagabond life, how did you sustain yourself? How did you pay for that? Were you just like living like a monk very modestly or were you, uh, you know, lying, cheating and stealing to kind of get by from time to time? Or were you just working odd jobs? How did you, how did you live that life? Send me all of the above, I guess, you know, nothing, <laughs> nothing, illegal, nothing illegal, really, you know, like I dabbled in that when I was a little bit younger. I mean, I'm pretty skilled at everything and I'm pretty confident that I can do anything as well, you know, so I've been uh, like, I, I wanted to snowboard over in France in the French Alps, so I made out I was a chef and I've become like a fucking head chef over in Italy because of it and I'm in like, so all these sort of crap. Hold on, hold on, right? hold on, hold on. Hold on. Crazy Tell me more. Shit Tell me more. How did that happen? What, what are you talking about? <laughs> Do you apply for a job as a head chef, even though you have no experience cooking? Yeah. I'll give you the quick version of it, right? This is just one of these things. It's fucking my life's like pretty out of control. But anyway, this is one of them. So I wanted to, I was living in Australia and I wanted to go over to the French Alps. So my mate said, hey, let's, let's just go over to London first. And I said, all right, we'll go to London. He organized for us to have jobs when we went over there. We got over there. We weren't in London. We're out miles away from hundreds of miles away in like pony sh dodgy castle wearing this waistcoat and i'm like why don't f wear a waistcoat and wait on people what's going on here this isn't what i fucking signed up for so anyway i blew that place out and i was like this so i just got drunk one night and they're like you can't be here if you're getting drunk i said sweet it'll give me a payout then and i'll piss off so they gave me like six weeks pay and i went straight to the nearest airport and, and flew over to geneva and then went up to to Chamonix in the French Alps. I was staying at a backpackers there. 
And all the rest of the people there were like chefs and stuff and they were all going for these jobs. I was thinking, shit, maybe I need to get a job. And I could cook and everything as well, like a little bit. I'd never like done it in commercially or anything, just at home cooking. And uh, they'd come back and they're like, oh, I said, can you get me an interview? So I went and had this interview and the executive chef, he was like, oh, you look like a young George Clooney. And I was like, oh, cool. Does that mean I've got a job? And he's like, yeah, all right. Okay, you can start. So I became like a chalet host and I was supposed to start just cooking like continental breakfast for people staying in the chalet and then cook them like a set dinner at night. And then the, the day before I was supposed to start, we got poached by this other ski company. So I went over there and I'm like, what, what am I now? So the executive chef's like, oh, you can be sous chef. So you're second in charge. So I was like, now where there was like seven chefs underneath me, this huge kitchen, flagship hotel. And I was thinking, what the f- is going on here? But have you ever worked in a commercial kitchen? Never worked in a commercial kitchen right before. I was like, oh yeah, sign me up on this because they give me an apartment, the lift passes, all the old thing, and I can fucking blag my way through here, no worries. But some of the things like the chefs would go, oh, chef, chef, come over here, taste this. And I'd have a taste and think, what the fuck am I even tasting here? And I'd go, oh, what do you think it needs, mate? And I go, oh, seasoning, that's it, spot on, son, get onto it. <laughs> I just wander on, right? <laughs> I'd just hang out with the baker most of the time because he was an Aussie as well. I'd just get him to make me little fucking donuts and shit that he wasn't supposed to make. And then anyway, they're like, all right, you've got to go over to Italy and run this hotel over there, like as a head chef. And I was like, that's like a sous chef. There's other people who can like carry my weight. This is a head chef. You got to come up with the menu. You got to, you got to find suppliers. You have to buy ingredients. I was freaking out, right? What's going on here? I was, I think I was like 28 at the time, right? So I was like, so I went over to Italy and I was just going, what's going on here? And anyway, the manager, she goes, oh, Damien, come here. The last chef, he he ordered all these cod. And she's like, I'm thinking, oh, how much cod can he order? Like the fish cod. I'm thinking, no one eats that. And um, there's like three freezers. So he's done some dodgy deal, right? This last previous head chef. And I was like, F-. so I'm sitting there. And I remember like when I was younger, I got sponsored by like these board shorts called Xander, Xander board shorts, right? When I was surfing. So I was thinking, all right, so I'm going to. Hold on. You were a good this- enough surfer to be sponsored? Uh, don't, like, here's some pair of board shorts I wouldn't call okay. a sponsor or anything, right so I'm like all right well, I'm gonna put I'm gonna put this out as a ocean Xander fillet on a white wine creamy deal reduction on a better mash right I'm thinking that sounds cool so I put it on there's no such fish called Xander right at all there's no no fish that I know of <laughs> so I lay it out and I, we're putting it out and I've told the other couple of little chefs what we're doing on our manager comes in she's like Damien, Damien, the uh, people want to see you in the restaurant. I'm there. I'm gone. That's it. Pack my shit. I'm out of here, right? Walk out. Everyone's standing ovation. Go, woo! And I'm like, what's going on here? They're like, this is the best sand fillet I've ever had. And I was like, how good is it? Like, this is fucking crazy. And then, then it like, got weird, right? So I went snowboarding this one day and then I'll come back and. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Got weird after that? It wasn't weird yeah, before yeah. that? Nah. She got even more weird, right? And um, so I'm, I'm snowboarding all day. And um, the previous head chef, he was Aussie as well. He'd done this dodgy fucking deal, right? He must have been in this dodgy dude. And it's only a small town, right? It's Sydney. So I'll go back and I'm at my hotel. And then I'll get woken up by the manager. And she's like, Damien, Damien, what have you done? And I said, oh, nothing. What do you mean? And I was saying, fuck, is the kitchen on fire? No, and she goes, no, 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 the police are coming for you. I was like, what the fuck are they coming for me for? I'm like, she goes, oh, the person at this other uh, hotel, he's called him and you've had dealings. I said, no, I've only just got here. That must be the the previous guy, not me. Let me go and sort it out. And she goes, nah, it's not like that here. There's a guy here waiting for you. And I was like, who's this guy? Anyway, I walk out, there's this guy, he's about seven foot tall, no neck, bald head, huge dude. And he goes, you're coming with me. And I'm like, what the f- I'm going with you, mate? Look at the size of you. And he goes, no. Nah. She goes, no, here's my friend. Uh, my friend's in the mafia. They've given the police. They said, give him two hours to get out of the country. So they've got to run you back across the border, back into France. I was like, what the f-? And I had to like it. My girlfriend was with me at the time, and she's just bawling her eyes out going, oh, I'm not going anywhere with this guy. They're going to kill us. And I was like, just get in the car. We'll be right. In fact, all our shit got in this car and drove off. And then 
went across the border and back into France. The guy didn't say a word the whole way. I tried to talk to him, he didn't say nothing, and then dropped us off at the, at the train station, and, and that was it, back into fucking London after that. And for those years, was your life pretty adventurous, let's say, like this? Or was this a really isolated yeah. incident? Nah. Nah. My life's always like that. I don't know why. I mean, Let me ask you a question that I'm re- going to render out in my head. So listeners, please forgive me. Um, it may not make sense. But I, if I imagined your life as a bit of a timeline, and you know, you're know, you talking about... like I, I want to hear more stories about your 20s even and stuff. But... You know, like you're off, you're you're skating, you're surfing, you're snowboarding, you're off to London, you're suddenly a head chef here. If that's just like a few days of a decade of certain types of living, again, it's going to be super, I'm going to call it adventurous living. You're seeking the thrill, you're seeking something. But at the same time, you're working through your trauma, you're being more reactive, you're carrying all the past, you're listening to everyone else. And, and frankly, you're not happy because otherwise you wouldn't be making attempts on your own life and going to therapy and, and doing all that stuff. Okay, so that's you. And you go on the paddle and you learn these things and you go and have done all these other challenges. And you're still just adventurous. You're still searching. You're still chasing. You still have this trauma past. It's not like it's gone away. But you're no longer being so reactive. You've now stopped listening to other people. You've started pushing yourself more and more and you're doing more things that you know to be true. But it's it's not like the you has has changed that much. Is is that kind of fair? Like, or like, did you just become more true to yourself by having mm-hmm. faced the trauma and using this as fuel, or was it about you re- like losing, like shedding away the stuff that was holding you back? Like, how to help me understand whether you are just more you in the truest sense because you faced this trauma and worked through it. Or if I'm looking at this wrong. No, I mean, that's right. So basically what it is, it's quite simple, really. I'm still going in the same direction. I just have a different perception of where I'm going, what I'm doing. That's all. So as an example, let's say the paddle, right? So beforehand, paddle, everyone's like, you're going to die, blah, 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 all that sort of shit. Now, I thought, well, this is something that I believe in and I'm willing to die for what I believe in, Right. Without it being a suicide mission, I was like, I'm willing to die for what I believe in to get this message out there. Then after day five, it changed to I was still going in the same direction, still doing the same event, still on the same paddleboard, still doing the same fucking motion and everything's gone on, except I was now living for what I believed in. It's exactly the same. I just looked at it in a just a little bit different way. And it's the same now, you know, like... There's a lot of stuff that goes on, but I have like, they're all calculated risks. And, you know, I'm so thankful for being so sporadic and having these moments over in London and France and everything, because I learned so many skills out of it. And a lot of people that I see in life, they're like, oh yeah, like I used to paint when I was younger, but you know, there's no point in me doing it now. Or I used to do like mechanics when I was younger, but like, oh, there's no point in doing it now. It suits me no purpose. but for me, on the paddle, everything I did made sense. You know, I looked at it, I'm like, oh, I've got a whole, I'm like an old man with a tool shed full of tools that are sitting right in my back pocket. So we might just use the fucking supplies and gaffer tape for most of the jobs, but all the other tools are there when I need it, when something else pops up. People can have have their noises around me, have the doubts and everything around me. But, you know, and they're, everyone's, you know, entitled to their opinion of what I'm about to do. But at the same time, no one trains how I train who are having these opinions. No one does what I do and no one has the trust within themselves that I do, you know, and that's uh, they're only putting that lit more distrust within themselves and more boundaries and barriers around themselves by doubting me because for me, it's got no effect on me. If I say I'm going to go and do something, all I do is go and do it. So as an example of that, the last balloon ride that I did was in Australia in May. And this time I went up to 10,000 feet and stepped out of the basket at 10,000 feet and climbed up this rope ladder to the top of the balloon with no parachute on. (laughs) Can Can I just ask you that, like I'm afraid of heights and I've had to do some things that... I think are challenging, you know. So when you tell me that you were in a hot air balloon, you know, over the plains of Australia or whatever, at 10,000 feet, 
And you decide that you're going to climb to the top of the hot air balloon so that without a parachute, I can understand it. But I have to imagine, I've seen the footage, I have to imagine with every time that your hand goes up the ladder, are you, are you, is it just like no big deal? Or are you literally saying, move, next, don't fall, hold on tight? Right? Like, how do you not let fear just take over? Well, I mean, that, that, that was an interesting one, that one. So even beforehand, people, you know, I've been doing events for the last eight years, all sorts of different. And uh, that, was, that one, I had friends from all over the world calling me. My friends in Australia called me at like 11 o'clock at night saying, hey, I can't sleep, you know, can you please not do this climb part? Do the do the climb at the top, but you know, do the jump off at the top. But can you please not do the climb? Like I can't see how it's possible to do. But again, you know, they don't see how I train or anything for that. But it was quite interesting, and um, you know, for that. But then when I was up there, you know, I knew I was going to climb. There was a few things that I couldn't train for on the ground. So it was minus one degrees up there. It was moving at 25 kilometers sideways and upwards, you know, 30% less oxygen as well. It was a 42 meter climb that I had to do. And, you know, but for me, I just, the production executive producer, he's like beforehand, like a few days beforehand, he goes, you know what would be great? So I'd go from ahead. He goes, you know what would be great? If you can like climb when you're going for the climb, just stop and have a little look down and look around. Yeah, I'm thinking, yeah we need that. we need the footage. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm like that, mate. I'm going. Oh, I said I've never been in this position before. I don't know how I'm going to act or react to it, but I can tell you now. I'm thinking I'm looking up, and that's where I'm fucking climbing to. I don't know if there's going to be any look downs. And anyway, just before, like, I calmed myself down, did my breathing and everything, slowed my heart rate and everything down just before I stepped out. And and his voice popped into my head, can you have a little look down? And I thought, ah, oh, fuck it. So I went to the edge of the basket and thought, oh, I'll have a look down now. But I was that in that calm of space that I looked down and I was like, oh, how amazing are the paddocks, you know, different colours and shapes and everything that was going on. Cool, where have I got to climb? Nice, took another breath. On the out breath, I just started climbing. So I was in the most relaxed that I could be, and I started climbing out. It was tough, and I fumbled away and everything as well because it was on a major overhang. So it's not like I could climb a ladder in a normal way. I had to snake my arms up and really use my arms and over hook my legs on like on the ladder and climbing up. But I've got about, I don't know, five, six metres out, and my leg just started shaking out of control. <laughs> the rest of my body and everything was nice and calm and everything, but my legs just going <laughs> pushing like this. That's your nervous system. Like, That's your nervous system yeah, trying to fight your brain. Nervous eh? system's just taken over and it's gone. Hey, we don't do this. What's going on here? And danger around, right? But instead of it allowing that to take over. You know, to hit my like subconscious and then the conscious actions from it. As soon as that started going, I just stopped for a second. I literally looked down at my leg and said, Hey, mate, we're out now. There's no going back. We have to just go to the top. Let's just keep climbing. And it was that calm. And then it just stopped straight away after that. And I just climbed. I had this beautiful climb up there and just started singing a little song to myself. And I got halfway up to the equator. And then I just stopped there and just enjoyed the moment, had a little look down and cruised around and then didn't celebrate because I knew I had a bit bit more to go and then climbed up and just keep climbing up to the top and, and that was it, you know. And there's like there's this amazing moment, especially on that one, that I capture for the rest of my events as well. And it's this breath. It's just it's that internal breath when you know that you've just achieved something before you have that outburst. So you might be running down like, might be thinking, I'm, you know, I've got half a mile to go on this marathon and I can't make it. This is crazy. And then all of a sudden you see the finish line. You're like, I've got this. And then the arms go out. Yes, I've got this, you know, but it's that moment just before that internalized breath. That's what I capture to be able to take me to the next event. So that's what my subconscious is full of. Now my subconscious used to be full of all the, all the bad stuff, all the negative things from my past and everything that had attached itself to that along the way in that tunnel vision that we we're talking about. That's what used to be in my subconscious. But now that's just been all emptied out. Now I just have cool shit in there that I just go, 
Well, they said that was going to be impossible. Well, how do they know? I'm going to go and do this. So as soon as I pick an event, I don't think about it. And with that one as well, going back to the, the climb part, people are like, what happens if you let go? And I'm like, well, I can die. So for me, there's no pressure. I know what happens. So I don't need to think about that. All I've got to do is concentrate on training as hard as I can to get to the top. And that's all I need to think about. Are you not afraid to die? Oh, man, I think I'll live for another 100 years for sure. <laughs> like it was, it was embedded into me at a young age that today could be my last day. So I guess, you know, like it when doesn't I Doesn't it seem like a cruel injustice that those who are most comfortable dying are the ones who live the longest <laughs> and the ones who live in fear of passing for some reason seem to go too soon? Yeah, they probably put themselves in there because they think about it more. They manifest it maybe, you know. Who knows how that, that really works. But, you know, for me, I lived such a long time. Like today could be my last day. And that's what was programmed into me as a kid. You know, was, I didn't know if I was going to go home and I was going to be dead by the by nightfall, you know, every day. This is for years, you know, five years that was going on every single day of my life, you know. So that was just embedded into me like a clock. And Help me with this because... Because this is something I hear people talk about all the time, right? I don't want to die with regrets. I don't want to be on my deathbed and look back and said I could have done something different. You know, you regret the things that you don't do rather than the things you do do. Like all of that stuff's cool. But I still carry this sadness. Like I don't think I'm afraid to die. I don't think I'm afraid to die at all. But it makes me really sad. It makes me really sad to think of my kids not having me. It makes me really sad to think of... Like when you talk about that moment of like, if I let go if and, and I'm falling, I'm dead. It's not like the, the, the let go. It's not the like falling. It's it's the time in between when you, when you know and you're like, oh, fuck. Oh, shit. Oh, no. This is it. Like that makes me um, sad. Do you know what I mean? And and I I don't I, I want to be I want I don't want that I want to be more like use every day as your last day use every moment as as the moment you never know when you will say goodbye to people or they will say goodbye to you and just cherish live for now and all of that stuff but it just makes me really sentimental and sad does that not happen to you well not really because I th- maybe you're putting like too much emphasis on that you know like it's when your numbers up it's up. And that's it. We don't yeah. know when that is at all. You know, whether it's fucking climbing up a hot air balloon or or stepping out and getting hit by a bus. We don't know at all. You know, so look, you know, there's there's so many incidents that happen in life. And even with some people I, I know, you know, that they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. They shouldn't have been there, but they caught the flight plane went down or they slept in, missed the alarm and the plane went down. They were supposed to be on that flight. You know, like who's to say that if they didn't catch that flight, they were something else would have happened to them. We don't know. You know, so we don't we can't gauge when it is. But it's not like we stop ourselves and go, well, I better not drive a car because there's so many car accidents and I could die driving a car. But we don't think about things like that. So I just look at it as a whole, you know, everything's the same for me. So if I climb up the balloon, how many people have died climbing up the side of the balloon? None. <laughs> no. <laughs> how many people are stupid enough to put themselves in that situation? Yeah, one. one. <laughs> you. Yeah. So what's everyone else gauging it off? If no one else has done it before. Yeah. But people say, no, you're going to fall and you're going to die. How do they know? A few weeks ago, one of my favorite entrepreneurs and, and kind of heroes I look up to, Ken Block, who people may know, uh, yeah, he's, yeah. he's the founder of DC mm-hmm. Shoes uh, and then yeah. sold it. He's, he decided to become a rally driver. He created those YouTube series that I can't figure out how to pronounce, Jim, Jim, Jim Aquaya or something. But anyway, he's mm-hmm. the guy who's ripping around in the cars through San Francisco and jumping. And I've loved learning about him, about his past, about him building uh, Hoonigan, about just like, I, I love the way he does business. I love the way he did business, sir. I love the way he thought. I love his creative energy. I love how he put himself on the line. And yet, he passes away snowmobiling, like, yeah, in a bit of an extreme environment, but it just seemed so sudden and, and surprising. And yet he spent his life always putting himself on the line. Yeah. Um, and so I, I respect him and, and I, and I want to be more like him and I look up to him and I marvel at his courage. And yet it's just like, ah, oh, 
it's kind of sad that he's gone now. Yeah, well, I mean, there's one of those prime examples of it, you know, even like even Steve Irwin, you know, from Australia, you probably know, like wrestled crocodiles and did all sorts of stuff and then just got... He was swimming and he got stung by a stingray. stingray. Yeah. yeah, and now he went. You know, I know other people have been done by stingrays and they're fine. They got, you know, the bar put in them, but he just got it right in that one spot. You know, so you just, you never know when it's up. So I don't think you can live your life thinking too much about it or thinking, oh, you know, today could be my last day, so I better get the most out of it because you're still looking at it in a negative sense rather than just doing what you want to do. You know, you see kids, you've got kids, you see them on like, they've probably got those scooters, you know, when they're young, get on those scooters, they're head down, they're just like, boom, they're off, (laughs) I don't care. But when you see the older kids, a little bit older, when they're older, like older than five or seven sort of thing, and their mum's gone, oh, don't go down there, you're going to hit a rock and come over. And then they're a little bit more cautious with themselves. They're not so gun ho because yeah. they start listening and understanding. But the chances of, of them hitting a rock and going over is probably never going to happen at all. So you think of all those, they seem like little things, but you think of all those little things, all those little boundaries that get put around ourselves. So another generic word that gets used a lot, and I used to say myself as well, is two, right? One is pushing the boundaries. Oh, it's about pushing the boundaries. But for me, if I look at it in a logical sense, in a visualized sense of that, pushing the boundaries means when I'm about to go into an event and I'm in it, I push these boundaries out. And then when I succeed on the event and I don't do anything for a while, then those boundaries come back in. And next time I go into another event, I've got to push those same boundaries out again. Yes. Yes. So, so I'm like, well, why am I still pushing these same boundaries out? I'll just get rid of them. How do you get rid of them? So you just touched on a story that I used to tell my friend Evan Carmichael. You know, at my cottage growing up, there was this thing we called the bluff. And since the 1920s, people had been going there. It's about 35 feet off the water, this rock cliff, and you would climb up and you would jump off. And so when we were kids, our, you know, our, our slightly older people would take us to the bluffs. And I remember this, you know, like when you're a little kid and you're standing 35 feet off the water and you're staring at the black water looking down and it's this sheer drop, it's like you, there's nothing you can tell yourself to throw yourself off. But you take a bunch of steps back and you, you, just, you just start running. And mm-hmm. then before you know it, you're like in the air, you count to two and suddenly smack, you hit that water and you go way deeper than you thought. And, and then you come up. But the next time you climb to the top, you have zero fear. Like you've broken the, the bubble of fear mm-hmm. and you can just spend all day throwing yourself off this cliff. And then before you know, it, people are diving and they're doing jumps and you're, you're you know, egging your friends and you're pushing them off and stuff. And then you, know, you go away for a few weeks, you, maybe half a summer or whatever, you come back and you climb to the top and that fear is just as strong as it's ever been. Yeah. And you got to like throw yourself off. And then the more you do it, the more you know and trust. Okay, like I just got to throw myself off once and this will be fine. And you start to trust that. But my friend, I was telling him about this story and he's like, this is just like life. The, the secret is to always be jumping, <laughs> right? If you jump and break the fear and then wait six months, wait nine months, wait a year, that's not the answer. The answer is to always be jumping because you don't allow for that fear to creep back in. Now you're saying the answer is to break the fear down completely, which sounds to me like you're unlocking a brand new level of thinking for me. Because I've always just thought, just keep throwing yourself at things. But you're saying that you can actually break the fear. How? Well, for me, I just look at it in a more logical sense. So, <laughs> As opposed to my illogical sense. <laughs> yeah, well, most people do. You know, so let's go back to the you know the climb of the tree, the jump jumping off into the water. The logical sense would be, oh, I was all right last time, so I'm going to be all right this time, and that's it. And you run and jump. Now, that's not to say that the inner critic's not going to be in your head, but it's just if you think of that inner critic more like background music. You can have background music going on and not be engaged in it and do your work and, you know, be focused on work that you got going on, then all of a sudden, like, a song comes on that you like and then you can, like, boom, be engaged in it. Then I I don't like next one, got to go back to work. And then that's out again. Same thing that can happen with your inner critic as well. You know, we can either engage in it or we don't engage in it. But it's also, if you think of, like, you know, monkey mind, it's called. So 
thing of monkey running around the tree and everything. If you sit, sit there, the monkey's going to keep on going. But if you just if you go against it or give it a little job task, then it kind of just chills out and just goes away and then then off you go. You're jumping off into the water again. So for me, it's just about breaking them down and looking at it in a more logical sense and not having the doubt of other people. And it takes a little bit of time, but for me, I just started to have a look at people who were doubting me saying, oh, no, nah, you, you, you can't. You can't run around Phuket Island. It's impossible. You can't run 130 kilometers around Phuket Island, let's say. Now, for me, I started to have a look at them and go, you don't even walk around the block. How do you know <laughs> if someone can run around an island? Like, who are you to say that? What have you done to say that, you know? There's a lot of people out there, you can do this, you can't do that. I'm like, how? And I started asking one question to other people and then to myself as well of, how do you know? And that's all it is. How do you know? And there's, you know, and that's that's a question I started to ask therapists when I was going to them as well is how do you know? How do you know that's going to work? What trauma did you go through? And what how did did you use this to overcome it? And they're like, oh no, 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 but this is what we study in school. No, 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 I'm not asking that. How do you know? And if they don't know, well, they don't know. Go on. Go and do it. That's the only way that you're going to find out. So it, it's been thrown back onto me sometimes. You know, I had a real friends who are vegan and they're like, you know, if you were vegan, you'd be fitter, faster, stronger, you'd have more endurance. I go, and look at you, you weigh about a buck and you're like, you don't even walk around a block. You're telling me I, I'll be more endurance. I've just broken 15 world records. Like how <laughs> more fit you think I can be, you know? Compared to how many have you broken? But then I'm like, all right. And I'm like, yeah, but how do you know? And they're like, how do you know? And I'm like, hmm, fair enough. So how do, I ask myself, how do I know? So I go to Thailand. I spend four months in a vegan uh, retreat there, yoga retreat, and best nutritionists and, and chefs and everything give myself like 100% into it to see if this is what's going to make me fitter, faster, stronger. Something's going to be a natural performance for me you know, help with my cognitive thinking and everything. Fuck, I'm in, I'm in for it. Let's go for it. Didn't work for me. Does for some people, didn't work for me. But you know what? Now I know. And that's it. So it's not like me just having an opinion about something. I don't talk about things unless I actually know, you know, and have a, a clear understanding of it and know without a doubt, you know, because really all we know is what we know and that's it. And that's the problem because most people are so book smart, you know, and intellectual just from being academic and reading things, but they don't actually know. If you think of like, look at free diving, you know, 50 years ago, the data had shown that no one can go below 50 feet or they're going to implode. People are going 270 feet now. So if you look back at them, the people that were going through like the pattern recognition from the data that they were collecting, they're just fucking numbers and figures and stuff without them even going in the water holding their breath. And this is the problem as well with trauma. We're getting told all these things and all these ideologies that have just been passed down and translated from Russians fucking years ago, but no one's actually ever tested them properly. No one has, has actually really understood them. You know, so it, but it was out of those therapists telling me that, that I'll try to take my life. And now looking back, I think how dare they who are they to take hope away from me, telling me I can't heal from what happened to me as a kid? I have to live with this for the rest of my life just because they're too fucking lazy or too ignorant and arrogant to go and do the work themselves to really find out. So I was never going to be like that. If we want to see the success you've had, if we want to be able to face our trauma, if we want to be able to do half of the things that you've been able to do... <laughs> Obviously, we have to come to terms with it. We have to work towards it. But you know, I always, I always give myself these little challenges. You know, I, I, I'm Canadian. I like to wear shorts all the time. So mm -hmm. I walk, I don't know, between three and maybe six kilometers a day on average. And I'll always winter, summer, it doesn't matter. I'll go out in shorts. Um, if it's like extremely blizzardy, I might, I might put on a pair of pants. But, but I find hiking in shorts with, with a jacket on and some gloves is way better. But also, people like look at me like I'm crazy, which I love. Uh, some people comment and go like, "Yeah, that's a Canadian outfit," which I also love. Um, and and more than anything, it just kind of makes me feel like a badass. So I I, I do it because it 
gives me confidence on something I would normally do anyway. And I know that it's silly and I love it. Uh, I went out for a hike a bunch of weeks ago on on the Niagara River, which is the border between Canada and the US, Niagara Falls, many people know about it. But the river, yeah. the river becomes kind of this like 90 foot, so 30 meter gorge. And there's this beautiful path. And sometimes there's fences on the path and sometimes there's no fence. So I'm walking along and I'm looking down and I'm like, I want to get down to the water. And there's no signs here that say you can't go down to the water. And there's no fence here. But, but I'm Canadian, right? Like, and us, us Canadians have these, like, we, we, we like to be good people. We like to follow the rules. No one likes to break the rules. Everyone wants to be fair. And so I'm walking and I keep telling myself, no, you can't do that. You're going to get in trouble. And then so finally, get. so I like slide down this like muddy ravine gorge and I hit the water. I have to like jump down 10 feet and I'm like, I'm here. Like there's garbage everywhere because no one cleans it. You're not supposed to go down there. And I feel so good. And then I'm like, oh, am I going to get in trouble? And did I break the rules? And I'm like, no, Mark, that's the point. The point is that there is no rule. There's no one stopping you from doing this. It's not this dangerous. It's not a big deal. If you were a kid, you would have slid down a 90-foot hill. It's not a big deal. Then I got to climb up the hill. <laughs> and it's like, I'm like climbing up and I'm like, I, every step is so muddy. I have to like dig little footholds in. I'm holding on to dead trees that I'm thinking, oh gosh, what if these dead trees let go? No one comes down here. And I get to the top and there's brambles and my legs are all ripped up from the thorns. And I like emerge like out of nowhere to this really, you know, normal park. Like just think of the most boring path and park in the world. And I emerge from over the cliff, bleeding, covered in dirt. And there's these old (laughs) couples there just walking by. And I'm like, (laughs) I'm like, hey, how's it going? (laughs) And they think I'm the craziest guy in the world. And I loved it. And so (laughs) the reason I bring these up is I'm trying more and more to catch these little like, Ooh, what if? No, you can't do that. No, never mind. I'm going to go do it. And and I love these little challenges. Do you kind of recommend that we start like I'm starting? Like we start small. We start with the things that we think are rules that aren't really rules. Or do we sign up for the marathon or the Spartan race knowing, heck, we better train? Like, do we go for our version of big and scary and hard? Or do we just look for these little micro challenges? Uh, kind of day? We, I mean, we already, everyone already does micro challenges all day. You know, we always have to guess something, you know, should we cross the road here? Should we just run across the road? Should we go up to the light? Should we drive today? Should we hit like, we're always having these little challenges. Should I, should I cook? Or I've never cooked that before. Oh, should I cook it or okay, I'll cook, you know, like. So already having these challenges, but the difference is, is we're not processing what we're learning from each of these little challenges to get us Ah, through. Okay. And we'll be able to see it like, and then once you start consciously making yourself do these little challenges, it's not just about getting through and go, yeah, I I made it. It's about understanding how you made it. What obstacles did you need to go through to be able to complete it? And then start going, ah, start filing those away. And then you go into another challenge, you go, oh, that's the same thing, you know? So then things don't become much of a challenge. They just become more normal and natural that you're just going to go through it because you've practiced them so many times before, you know? So for me, I don't don't have those. I just go and do things. I know I don't. I don't have these. They're not challenges. I just go, this is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to train. This is how I'm going to eat. And this is what I'm going to go and do. Like I take all that pressure out of it and I take all those voices and the inner critics and the doubts from myself and from other, from other people out of it, you know, completely. I have that trust within myself that this is what I'm going to do. And if I don't succeed, I'll either go, oh, I didn't do that, or I'll just train harder and do it again. And kind of that's it. So for me, the only thing that only like the meaning of poss- impossible just means someone hasn't worked out how to do it yet. You know? And it's just, I just like to work out how to do it. And it's, I don't do things like all of my records, they're records because they're world first. No one's ever done it before, but it's not for an ego thing to go, hey, I'm the first person in the world to do it. But you know, if I'm the first person in the world to do it, there's no YouTube clips, there's no one I can call to ask how I do it. I've got to work it all out myself. And that's what I love about it. I love being able to process that. And, you know, there's not too many variables between all the challenges that we have in life. 
you know, people kind of separate things out and how they deal with the physical stress in in the gym or how do they deal with the mental stress at home or at work and the emotional stress here and there. But stress is just stress, you know, pressure is pressure. So instead of trying to divide it up and trying to learn out of different aspects that you have in your life, really we just have one life and there's just d- different job tasks that we have during the day in that one life. People go, oh, my, I've got a gym life, I've got a family life, I've got a business life, I've got a fucking car life. And I'm like, mate, you got fucking one life. It's just different shit that you do. So you don't need to keep on learning how to do things. If you know how to push yourself and keep going on the treadmill, then you need you know how to do it while you're in business as well in those tough moments and be able to keep on going. You need you know how to climb up that muddy hill as well at the same time because you've already practiced all these things all the way through. So things just become easier and easier what you do. And then once you do that, once you start seeing things that way, then you can start really exploring of what else can you do, you know, and just look at things in a logical way. Like what's the worst case scenario, even about that? What's the worst case scenario of, of you sliding down the hill of someone saying, all they're going to say, you shouldn't be down there, mate, get the fuck out. And that's yeah, yeah. it. That's you're it. not going to get in really any trouble, but that's it, no. you know. As long as your like, intentions are right, your morals are right, you're not hurting anyone else or anything like that, go and do what you do. And then just if something, someone doesn't like you doing it, they'll tell you and you go, okay, I well, know I don't need to, don't, I can't do that then. That's it, you know. Mm-hmm.